want you to give a warm welcome to Eric Rodriguez, who's the Senior Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Unidos US. Sir. I know I've heard many people appreciate what has gone into you know, making this day um, happen, uh, as well as the information that we're all getting, which is really just the start. There's a lot more um, to come. And as we mentioned, this kind of input is really, really good for us. At Unidos US, I've been there almost 30 years. So I've been through some of the great battles um, on the education front, the other four letter words, uh, some of which have been mentioned, NCLB, dare I say it, uh, ESSA, and other rounds of, of federal education reauthorization, which is so important. We simply cannot achieve the goal of systemic nationwide equity without a strong federal role. Um, and there's a real opportunity uh, for us every time a major battle comes up uh, around reauthorization. And there will be some one day uh, and I think part of this exercise is to prepare ourselves you know, for that, given what we've seen and heard um, today and what we know from our own experience. Um, first, as was mentioned earlier today, the NAEP scores of a week ago and what we've seen with, with respect to education loss in black and brown communities, enormously disconcerting, right? We've got a big problem out there. And I know we're very worried about that and how we catch up and how we deal with that. Uh, being front and center, what's the, the most effective way to do catch up in the time that we have, or we risk losing a whole generation. So I know that's a great concern to us. Um, you know, I, I know there's, there's no question that, you know, a lot of what you heard today, it rings true, right? This is a very complex and difficult set of issues. I find myself hearing a point being made and I'm like, yeah, you know what, I agree with that. And then a counterpoint being made and I'm like, yeah, you know, that's kind of true too. Uh, you know, so, so it all depends on what your perspective is and what level you're sitting at and what's been your experience. But the, the basic thing here is that uh, there's a lot of perspective under this tent, right? There's so much richness in our experience. And what we know is that demographically the country is changing by 2044. 14 states will be majority minority, right? And it's already happening in our schools. Uh, right, the time for change is now. And the time for us to be engaged and be working together uh, toward that change is now, right? So this is our opportunity um, to start from the start so that the next battle that comes up, we're not co-opted or working towards someone else's agenda in the system, but our own, right? This is our voice, this is our experience. And that's what we're trying to capture here uh, with the hope that it will really lead to greater engagement uh, going forward. Um, you've heard a lot of it, right, um, today. Um, people have mentioned organizing, right, the importance of action. My colleague often says the way you get change in the system is parents raising fists, right? When you see uh, a parent engaged or an advocate there day in and day out fighting, um, then things start to happen, right? If we looked at, at what some of the NAEP scores will tell us, Parents were home. <laughs> Many started paying attention to what their kids were doing. Many who could afford it and had the resources took steps, um, and their kids have benefited from that. But where those resources weren't there, we're seeing gaps grow, right? Uh, we're seeing it happen before our eyes. So more work needs to be done, and together is the way we're going to do it. Um, so our hope is that this is really the beginning, uh, that these are increasingly issues that we can own uh, that we have to engage in uh, at the federal level, at states, in districts. And everyone has a little bit of something that's correct and right. We want to see change in classrooms, right? We want to see behavior change. Um, and there's a way to do that, but we also need to hold the system accountable, right? And there's a role for both of those things to happen. At some point, as we enter the federal debate and politics take over, we're gonna have to make some decisions, right? This system, everyone seems to agree is not working, right? One of the fundamental ways it's not working, as was mentioned earlier today, is that it's not controlling the allocation of resources. That's a huge problem, right? So something has to change, we all recognize that. I think the question for us is where do we go from here? And what can we agree on? How can we work together? And in that process, it is gonna be a process. We need to hear from everyone, right? We need to bring everyone along. Um, and that's the way that we're gonna win on this and other issues nationally. So, um, so my thanks again, my thanks to all of you. It's a great pleasure for us to host this conversation, to continue to work together uh, with many of our colleagues toward change. 
Um, I think I'm going to hand it off <laughs> to you. Yes, good. Thank you. But thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. So next up, I have uh, the pleasure of, of introducing the president and CEO of the National Urban League, Mr. Mark Moriel, who's going to give some opening remarks as well. Sorry about that, Joe. Uh, some opening remarks as well before we get into the civil rights panel. So, Mark, please come on. In. Come on now. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Eric. Give Eric a big round of applause. Thank you all very much. Uh, let me do a few things. Uh, I want to thank uh, the team at the National Urban League's Department of Programs Division of Education uh, and Washington Bureau and the staff at Unido US uh, for assembling, planning, orchestrating, organizing, and preparing this great conversation today. Let's give them a big warm round of applause. Dr. Hal Smith, uh, thank you all very much. Let me also acknowledge all of the Urban League leaders from all across the country. You guys stand up. I'm so glad to see you all uh, here to be a part of this conversation. Thank you for your leadership, uh, your hard work, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes to maybe uh, offer a broad perspective on what we are doing today. We're playing offense. Say offense. offense. The last several times that the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was reauthorized, we were responding to policy prescriptions and ideas written, defined, and orchestrated by others. And we were placed in many respects in a posture to react off of thoughts, amendments, changes, negotiate, because others in rooms that were both smoke-filled and not smoke-filled <laughs> planned and thought about, sometimes well-intended, yes, but many times in a vacuum, without the true advocates for children of color and poor children in the conversation at the beginning, at the beginning. And so by playing, this whole vision is to play offense, to have a dispassionate critique of what is right and what is wrong, what has worked and what has not worked over the last 20 to 25, but over the last 50 years, so that we can be best prepared with our own ideas, our own thinking, our own policy prescriptions about what the future holds. And that we have to have that mindset going into this. We can represent and speak for the children, the parents, the hopes, and the aspirations of our communities. And for too long, we've been the caboose on the public policy train. And we're gonna be what? The engine on the public policy train. That's what this is about. That is what this is all about. And so in bringing all of us together, it has been to get a look at what experts have analyzed, but the most exciting next steps are gonna be about creating guardrails, if you will, and principles to govern the discussion going forward. Now, I've long been like many, and I come to this not only as someone who proudly leads the National Urban League, but I'm a parent. I have a high school junior now. I have a son who's a junior in college. Uh, I have a legions of nieces and nephews matriculating through all types of different schools in different places all across the country and always think that in these discussions, 
we always have to center what is best for children. We have to continue to go back to that, but we have to think about what is best for children, not just in the instant moment, but what is best to help them accomplish, achieve, and fulfill the talent that they've been given and the aspirations that they have and that we have for them. And we've got to center that. Uh, secondly, it's always been puzzling to me why assessment systems that have been used have not broadly assessed inputs into the system. One input is money. Money matters. Don't let any of these pencil pushers tell you money doesn't matter. Money matters. Money governs class size, computers, teacher compensation, quality of extracurriculars, whether schools are air conditioned or not. Money matters. Money matters. And we cannot allow ourselves to be bamboozled into throwing a shade over the historic long-term funding disparities in America's school systems. Differences from county to county within a given state, differences within a school district from school to school, difference within a city between school on this side of town and school on that side of town. So we have to broadly, when we talk about conditions, Brown v. Board and in related cases was about school bus, transportation. Why did black children have to walk a long way and white children had a bus to go a shorter distance? One of the factual antecedents of segregation was to look at inputs. Teacher pay, black teachers made less than white teachers. It took lawsuits and litigation to change that. My mother was a plaintiff in one of those lawsuits uh, a long time ago when she was a second grade teacher in the 50s and the 1960s. So in thinking about what goes forward, we need to think broadly about what a 21st century assessment system is. We have to have broad information because disparities can't be squishy. We have to be able to put our hands on true evidence and reasons. And the narrow focus, look, I, I'm always torn about these tests. I just told Michael Nettles back there, I still have, oh, no, no, I don't want to hear you right now, Biggie. <laughs> uh, I still have nightmares from taking the bar exam in the last century, that's how long ago it was. I mean, you know, standardized tests, you know, I'm torn about uh, a standardized test, uh, but, but understand the need to have assessment tools, but also to not have debt over-reliance on single factors, you know, in an assessment system. So we're gonna get into this discussion a whole lot more, but I hope the inspiration and the direction that comes from this is we're gonna play offense. We're gonna, we're gonna be on offense in thinking, in designing, in constructing what we think is the best framework for a new elementary and secondary education act. Final thing, and I wanna, I wanna put this on everyone's mind because I'm concerned about it. Have you heard of the number 275 billion? Does that number make sense to you? That's the amount of supplemental dollars appropriated by the Congress in the various CARES, American Rescue Plan, and reconciliation bills. And I am concerned about what that money is being used for. And 
to some extent, because of the way authorizations are designed, a lot of this money went directly to states and governors. We got to throw some light and some accountability on that because there was more money appropriated for Title I than in the history of the United States in a single bill. Where is that money? Is it being used to address inequity? So my time is up, and I dropped the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.